Hey guys, I'm Brent Rose, writer and sun snuggling up behind your moon. On August 21st, 2017, there will be a total eclipse of the sun. It'll stretch all the way from the west coast to the east coast of the United States. It'll be the fullest eclipse the country has experienced in 100 years and you should get out and enjoy it. But you can't just stare up at the sky like a monkey from 2001 A Space Odyssey and expect to return home with your eyeballs intact. That's why today we're going over some tips to view and photograph the eclipse and do it safely. First, a quick primer. A solar eclipse is where the moon passes between the Earth and the sun, blocking the sun's light and casting a shadow onto the Earth in the middle of the day. Like playing planetary pool, everything has to be lined up just right. That means not everybody on Earth will get to see the sun completely blocked out. That will only happen for people in the path of totality, which coincidentally is the name of my forthcoming solo album. <laughs> The totality covers a band roughly 70 miles wide from north to south. It'll first hit the Oregon coast and drop south as it heads east, eventually finishing in South Carolina. If you want to know where and when you can see it, go to eclipse2017.nasa.gov. If you're in the path of totality, the sky will go dark and you'll actually be able to see stars come out. Now that'll only last for 2 minutes and 40 seconds at best, so let's talk about how to maximize that time. Tip number one. While the full blackout will only last a couple minutes, there will be a couple hours with the moon slowly encroaching on the sun and then leaving it afterwards. And this is amazing to see too. But here's the thing. It's only safe to look with your bare eyes when the sun is 100% obscured. The rest of the time, you're going to need specialized solar glasses. Deal with it. Warning! Stacking multiple pairs of sunglasses will not cut it. So if you're thinking about triple bagging your face, it's time for a new plan. Fortunately, true solar glasses are not expensive. They come in a bunch of different varieties, and you can pick them up online for just a few bucks. However, there's an important caveat. There are several sellers online selling these things that are not up to safety standards. Yes, those people will burn in hell, but not before you burn your retinas. NASA has advised that any solar glasses, filters, or viewers you use meet the following criteria. They must have certification information with this designated ISO number, have the manufacturer's name and address printed somewhere on the product, and not be used if they're older than three Three years or have scratched or wrinkled lenses. If you're looking for a reliable company, NASA and its partners have verified that products from these five companies meet international safety standards. Only buy from these guys. Glasses from those five companies are already selling out online, but if you go to your local science museum or planetarium, they may have some in their gift shop. We've also heard that some local libraries have them. Tip number two. NASA has advised that you don't use any kind of homemade lens as a solar filter. The one exception is you can use welder's glass number 14. Now it has to be number 14 at the very least. Most welder's goggles use glass number four or five, and that's not nearly enough protection. It's gotta be number 14. Tip number three. You know how we said you can't look directly at the sun with a naked eye? Well, multiply that advice times a thousand if you're using a telescope, binoculars, or an SLR camera. Have you ever seen somebody fry something using a magnifying glass in sunlight? That's basically what you'd be doing to your eyeballs. Now, some companies make specialized solar filters that you can screw directly onto your telescope's or camera's lens. We're talking ND 100,000. If you can find one at your local camera shop, good for you. But unfortunately, these are sold out almost everywhere. So here's our DIY solution. Use some thick black construction paper and wrap it around the outer tube of your lens. Mark where the ends overlap and tape it there. Cut it so it fits the barrel but doesn't obstruct the focus or aperture ring. Apply some thick gel-style super glue to the rim of the cylinder and then smush it down gently onto a sheet of solar filter from one of the five companies we mentioned earlier or onto a flat piece of number 14 welder's glass. You can cut away the extra film. These filters should cover the whole lens but not obstruct the shot at all. Leave it on until the sun has completely disappeared. Once the last bit of sunlight has vanished, it's safe to remove the filter for the duration of the totality, but make sure you put it back on before the sun starts to creep out again. For many of us, this will be a once-in-a-lifetime event, so it makes sense that you'd want to take a photo of it. There are far more exhaustive tutorials out there, but here are some quick tips. If you're using a DSLR, it is not safe to look through the viewfinder. This is because the camera's lens will amplify the light. You can only use the live view mode on the larger LCD screen. That's why I've chosen to use Sony's A7R II, which is a full-frame, mirrorless camera. The viewfinder is actually just a high-resolution screen, so I can look through it all I want and my eyes will be safe. It can also shoot images at a whopping 42 megapixels, so I'll be able to do some cropping and still make a poster-sized photo of the eclipse. Tip number four. Because of the Earth's rotation, the sun will appear to be moving across the sky. It'll travel the distance of its own diameter roughly every two minutes. If you're using a long lens, that'll make it very difficult to keep track of. One trick to finding it again is looking at the shadow your camera makes on the ground. Adjust it so that the lens completely disappears from the shadow, and you should be pointed in the right direction. An ideal and much higher-tech solution is using something like the Cube Pro 8200 from iOptron. 
This mount has a database of more than 150,000 celestial objects, including the sun. It can lock onto its position and automatically track it as it moves across the sky, so you never even have to think about reframing your shot. For lens selection, there's a lot of ways you can go. Personally, I'm going with a 400mm with a 2x teleconverter, giving me an 800mm equivalent. This should give me plenty of detail of the sun, but still provide lots of the sun's corona. Now, if you don't have a long lens, don't despair. Capturing the setting of where you are in the foreground is a way to preserve a unique image of the eclipse, and it'll stand out from all the other close-up sun porn out there. And lastly, some general tips. You're going to want to find the native ISO of your camera and use that. For most cameras, that's 100 or 200. While the sun is still visible and you've got your solar filter on, you're going to want to use a fast shutter speed. If you're in the path of the totality and it's fully disappeared, you can remove the filter and you're going to want to start using a longer exposure. But know that there will be huge variations within the brightness of the corona. So you're going to want to try a bunch of different shutter speeds. Everything from 1 1,000th of a second all the way up to a full 4 seconds. Tip number 5. Final tip, don't get lost in the technology. Make sure you're taking the time to really enjoy this unique once in a lifetime experience. But what do you think? Let us know in the comments below and subscribe to Wired if you haven't already. And with all that being said, there's really only one thing left to do. Go see the eclipse and buy my debut solo album. La, la, la.